on the well-being of our heart before God. Our scripture today is found in the fourth chapter of the book of Nehemiah, page 518 in the Pew Bible. We're continuing to look at this book under the overall theme of Under Reconstruction. And today's message is titled, Resisting the Temptation to Quit. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? So by the Ammonite who was at his side said, What are they building? If even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builder. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. The modern translation of that says, but we prayed and kept our powder dry. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plan and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. I've never been much of a physical scrapper. In fact, I have never been in a physical fight in my life. As a freshman in college, though, I had a course in physical education. Among the requirements was one to participate in a wrestling match, in fact, several of them. I cannot tell you how this terrorized me. As a person who has worn glasses since about the age of eight or nine, I've always been taught to be protective of my body. And the prospect of taking off my glasses and wading into the, onto the mat with someone, even though he was a little bit smaller than I, he was uh, fiercer than I. You've familiar with the little terrier dogs that just really seem to have a lot of sprink a maroo in them and this this guy that I was supposed to wrestle was that kind of person I saw myself as more slow more like a giant puppy dog in comparison to him that didn't want to fight at all but for the course we had to fight so I was going through this trauma of what to do when the little bell sounded that started the fight I thought what do I do do I get on the mat uh, do I let him come get me and I was so frightened that I finally decided the only I don't know anything about wrestling, what I'll do, as soon as they sound the bell, I'll run across the mat and I'll make it look like I've taken the initiative. You know, maybe I'll do something to him but and I won't know what to do after that, but I'll I'll run. So I sounded the bell, I ran across the mat, grabbed him, threw him down the ground, jumped on top of him, and the ref who was there goes <laughs> and the fight was over. <laughs> I still to this day don't know how I did it, but I hold the record 
in an intramural pin at Evangel College for six <laughs> seconds. Oh, it took me. <laughs> Going by a little rule, uh, let your winning fight be your last fight. <laughs> Six seconds. Wouldn't it be great if all of our fights were that easy? Just run out, tackle the opponent, bang, 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 and it's all over. Last week when Malkijah talked to us from Nehemiah 3, it may have looked like the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem were a six-second flat kind of proposition. It really wasn't all that easy. Nehemiah chapter 3 simply describes for us the fact that the walls went up. Whereas Nehemiah 4, 5, and 6 tell us the long process, the big fight that they went through to rebuild those walls. And so it is when maybe a historian looks back upon our life, they might be able to point to the success that we experienced in our spiritual walk. But if they're going to tell the truth about us, they're going to have to follow it with many chapters which record the spiritual struggles, the times it looked like we were going to fail, we never get our act together, so to speak. Every person that's being used of the Lord, every church that's being used of the Lord, every ministry that's being used of the Lord has had moments like are described in the book of Nehemiah when there is such a tremendous fight and often the odds look so overwhelming that it appears that these people could never succeed. And yet when the final story is written, success was given. I approach Nehemiah from the standpoint today that in our Christian experience we are either wrestling or nestling. And if we are nestling, that may be an indication that we are not in the fray, we're not in the work, we're not called to do, the, we're not responding to the call to do the job God's called us. So my message is to people who are very much in the fight, who are wrestling, who as Paul says, wrestle against not flesh and blood but against principalities and power. As we look at Nehemiah chapter 4, we first of all see today that there is pressure that is being put against Nehemiah. The pressure, first of all, comes from uh, this Samaritan governor named Sanballat and an Ammonite governor by the name of Tobiah. Now, in Nehemiah's case, it's pretty clear to discern where the opposition comes from. It comes from an evil source, but I wouldn't want to abuse the scripture by indicating that all opposition when we set out to do something is of necessity from the devil. There is some opposition that may not be from the devil at all. In fact, Balaam found that opposition was actually sent by God to get him going in another direction. Saul would have been better off if he'd have listened to counsel. A Rehoboam would have certainly been better off if he'd have listened to the older counselors and would have avoided splitting the kingdom in two. So there are instances in Scripture where people gave counsel and advice and they were dead right. So simply because we make up our mind to do something doesn't mean that it is therefore ordained and nobody can ever come along and give us a word of counsel or a word of correction or maybe even a word of criticism. We, what, if we, what happens if we reject all criticism that's coming to us is we become uh, so very foolish people. The Scriptures say in a multitude of uh, counselors there is wisdom, there is safety. How can we discern whether or not to follow the pressure that's given to us? Is it uh, from God or is it from an alien source? In Nehemiah's case, it's clear to be able to, to see uh, how to discern when pressure is being applied to our life that is not of God. One, uh, in, uh, one index is whether or not it is coming from persons who really are walking with God. In Sambalat's case, it's very easy to define him historically. He was a Samaritan. That is to say... He originally descended from a group of people that lived in Israel up until the year 722 B.C. when it was destroyed by Assyria. People were left in the land and they began to intermarry with the other people in the land and they began to adopt other gods as well. So Sanballat would be representative of a person who has really no understanding of the truth of serving God. Their God is pay respects to Jehovah, pay respects to Jesus, pay respects to Buddha, pay respects to Confucius, and on down the line everybody has equal merit. And when uh, we are facing pressure in our life, we might well look to see whether it's coming from a person who has a decided commitment to the Lord or whether it's coming from someone who doesn't really have any concept or understanding or obedience to God. We might also ask whether the opposition that's coming to us comes from persons whose motives are pure. 
If you notice, uh, Nehemiah indicates that the source of the opposition against him is coming from a person who is raging. Verse 1 of chapter 4, Sanballat was angry and became greatly incensed. Verse 7, they were very angry. When a person is attempting to apply pressure on your life from the standpoint that they themselves are emotionally upset, they're negative people, they're angry people, they are people that are lashing out, resist that kind of pressure. It cannot do you any good. For that kind of motivation coming against you from a person who is angry and pouring all of their hostility and their negativity into your heart is really tantamount to trying to pour acid on a rose bush. I've yet to discover a rose bush that grows if it is nurtured on a regular basis with acid. And persons who have a great amount of acid in their life love them, try to relate to them as best you can, forgive them, but do not receive the counsel and the put-downs that they are attempting to accomplish in your life. With St. Ballot's case also, we have a clear perception that the advice that is given does not spring from faith and it does not spring from someone who is working on a solution to the problem. There are many sideline critics. There are many people that can tell you how to run your life, but they cannot run theirs. There are many people who can sit on the sidelines and examine everything that the body of Christ does or the church does or a ministry does and find all that's wrong with it, but they themselves are not involved in doing anything except tearing down. When you apply all these kinds of tests to Sanballat and Tobias, very quick to see why Nehemiah rejects the pressure they're putting on his life and upon the work. And we must be able to do the same. We must discern, we must have spiritual eyes to discern where the thrust of pressure comes in our life. The people that are telling us, no, you shouldn't do that, or no, you can't do that, or no, you won't do that, or you're only this, this much capability and don't ever expect to be anything more than that. We've got to examine what people are saying to us and re-gear. Now, as we look through Nehemiah chapter 4, in response to the pressure, we find that pressure comes really on us in two different kinds of ways. There is a pressure on us internally to make us feel unequal to the task, and then there's the pressure externally, which confronts us with the largeness of the task and the hopelessness of getting it solved. When I look at Nehemiah and look at my own life and look at the church and look at the book of Acts, I see things all running through in common. Satan has a tried and, and true pattern of attempting to defeat the people of God and the work of God. And it simply involves trying to demoralize the leadership, trying to internally make uh, the people feel so weak that they can't do anything, and then trying to externally point out all the, the things that need to be done and saying to us, in view of all that needs to be done, look, you can never do this anyway. I think I chose, by the way, this series to preach in Nehemiah from the very selfish motivation that we're getting ready and then we're during the next three years of this major relocation proposal of the church. And I needed all the help I could get from Scripture. And I think this church does too. So with that in mind, I've already been forewarned as to some of the things that are going to arise in our experience. We're going to be attempted to be picked on internally, knowing if we can be defeated at the mind level and at the faith level, then we'll never put our hands to do the work. That's the same way in our individual life. How many times have you felt someone telling you, you can't live the Christian life. You don't have the strength to live the Christian life. You'll blow it again. You always fail, don't you? Do you really think you could ever be a Christian? Now, do you think that's the Holy Spirit? Does the Holy Spirit come along and say that to you? I don't think that's the Holy Spirit. I know that's not the Holy Spirit. I've learned in my life to distinguish between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of Satan. Satan is always saying, you can't do it. And he makes me so painfully aware of all my limitations and failures, but he never leaves me with a word of hope. All he leaves me in is despair. But the Holy Spirit comes along, and the Holy Spirit may from time to time need to correct me, need to point out something deficient in my life, but it will give me that a word of hope and give me a solution to get on with it. Well, all stand ballot and Tobiah do here in the opening verses of Nehemiah chapter 4 is poke at the weaknesses. They, they want the attention to be focused on the weakness, so they use loaded terms like you feeble Jews. Well, that describes their past. For 150 years they've been feeble. They haven't been able to get that wall rising off the plain level of the ground. So they've got a track record of being weak. You may have a track record of being spiritually weak. So what? Does that mean you've got to be spiritually weak all the rest of your life just because you've got that track record? But let me tell you, the minute you decide with God to do something about it, the first thing you're going to hear is, you are feeble. You can't do anything about that. Who do you think you are? 
And then they come along and say, look at these stones. They're, look at the rubble. It's uh, heaps of rubble, verse, uh, verse 3. Heaps of, or verse 2, heaps of rubble, burned as they are. When the Babylonians destroyed the city 150 years before, when the Babylonians finished the city, I mean they finished it. They just plowed everything under. And they, well, they burned it and then they plowed it under. And the limestone rocks, subject to such intense heat, now there's, there's internal fissures in the rock and who, who can hope to build a wall with rubble? And that's, again, the way our lives see many a time. We look around, there's just a bunch of rubble lying around. And the temptation comes, can you do anything with that? Look at, look at, you don't have anything to offer God. What could you possibly offer God? Look at the messes that you're in. Mess one, mess two, mess three. Do you hope to build anything out of that, that mess? God can't work with messes. He wants, you know. And then Tobiah, uh, to add insult to injury, ridicules them in a painful way. He says, why, even if a fox ran along that wall, the wall wouldn't support him. Now, I, I would respectfully submit that that is an insult. <laughs> Why, foxes aren't heavy enough to knock anything down. And they're very light-footed, as those of you know who have run from them on occasion. What is the enemy attempting to do in our life? He's trying to build a climate of negativity trying to put us down, to make us believe that nothing that God calls us to do can be accomplished. One of the things we have to do if we're going to be a faithful servant of the Lord is to be able to learn that criticism is part and partial, that this negativity is going to come upon us and we've got to get handles for how to deal with it. That's why Nehemiah is such a tremendous model. He shows us how to deal with this kind of thing. In verse 4 and 5, he shows us that instead of focusing upon weakness, when, when, when the enemy wants you to focus on weakness, don't focus on the weakness. Go to the Lord and focus on the Lord. It's his habitual pattern. Hear us, O Lord, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their heads. Give them over as plunder to the land of captivity. Nehemiah doesn't get in an argument with Sanballat and Tobiah here. In fact, there's no use to argue. If you've ever uh, had anyone shout at you and, you and you responded by shouting back you know that that really doesn't solve anything does it in fact ask yourself the, the last argument in your home if there was one that went on would it have ended sooner if one of you had quit shouting sooner <laughs> Nehemiah doesn't get in a hassle he simply goes to the Lord and lays out the situation before the Lord now, we may have different ways we want to lay a situation before the Lord. There's some who said, well, Nehemiah is living in the Old Testament, so he doesn't pray like Jesus. Jesus would have prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus may very well have prayed that. Jesus may have also said, on the other hand, what are you, you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites? And he could have reamed them out, too, like Nehemiah did. If you have problems with what Nehemiah prayed, maybe God is calling you to pray a prayer of forgiveness or the like. I think it takes a very spiritual person to pray the kind of prayer Nehemiah prayed. That prayer would be dynamite in the hands of someone that isn't really spiritually mature because they would, anytime anybody criticize them or oppose them, they'd call the wrath of God down from heaven. They'd be like James and John. So you've got to be somewhat spiritual to pray that kind of a prayer. But Nehemiah was not going to let that ne negativity coming from completely callous, spir unspiritual people destroy him and the work of God. And so he used strong language in prayer to confront it. And it doesn't hurt us at all when we come to the Lord in prayer and take a strong position in prayer that God has called us to do something, it's in his will, we can prove it from the scripture, that it's not God's will that we walk around like we are defeated in our Christian life, like we can't, we don't, we're not any match for the enemy, that we're always going to give in to the past. I mean, that is not what God is saying to us in the scripture. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If any person is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away, the new has come. Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. And we'll take our stand there. Nehemiah focuses on the Lord and then after he's focused on the Lord, he focuses on the task. Nehemiah is no mystic who just spends all of his time in prayer and then doesn't do anything as well. He prays to God and then he works. Uh, I like what someone has said, pray as if everything depends upon the Lord and work like everything depends upon you. And that's exactly what Nehemiah does. He goes to the work, verse 6. And he says, we pray to our, or, uh, uh, we rebuilt the wall, rather, till it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. The easiest thing to do when we are criticized is to give up. When we experience negativity coming over us, just to abandon the task. I wither under criticism. I wither under negativity. Somebody says to me, it can't be done. My initial reaction is, you know, I think you're right. <laughs> Somebody says, uh, look, this, 
this church in a, in a relocation effort is going to, to, to need to raise a million and a half dollars cash within three years to be able to do what God has put in your heart. And I just say, and somebody comes along and says, I don't think that can be done. I say, you know, I don't think it can be done either. <laughs> What's our initial response is to wither under that kind of pressure. But Nehemiah prays and he goes to work. I like what Teddy Roosevelt said. I don't know if Teddy Roosevelt was born again Christian or not, but this hap- I think is born again advice, okay? He says, It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming who does actually try to do the deed, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotion, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Nehemiah is going to give it everything. Praise and works. Well, now that he is somewhat successfully overcome this internal pressure, he's going to face external pressure. And the rest of the chapter deals with the external pressure that comes against him. You know, there, we, hmm, how do I put it? I fall into a habit of thinking that if I've got through one crisis, then there's no more crisis that are going to face me. If I can just turn this corner in the road, then it's going to be a straight road from here on out. Have you ever driven on a road, by the way, that's like that? It's all curvy. You think, oh, sooner or later we're going to come to a straight stretch and just keep coming around one bend after another. Well, sometimes criticism doesn't die down. Sometimes negativity doesn't die down. Sometimes the words of the tempter just don't go away. Instead, criticism may intensify. It's exactly what happens to Nehemiah in chapter 4, verse 7. When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the men of Ashdod heard that repairs were going ahead, they were very angry. Now, notice the number of critics has increased. And if you, if you want to see a, a great principle out of Nehemiah, note that critics run with critics. You get a few people who are picking away and it isn't going to be long until a few more people join in and, and a nice chorus, the duet, becomes a quintet or in this instance of, of it can't be done. And now the opposition is not only coming from Sanballat and Tobiah, but Sanballat is up in the north and Tobiah is in the east and and the, uh, the Arabs are in the south, and now Ashdod, a Philistine city on the west, is involved in the picture. So there is a military liaison going on these groups that completely make a perimeter around Jerusalem. And they're all pretty uptight with what is going on. Someone has said that all the water in the world won't sink the boat unless the water gets inside the boat. And here is all the water in the world trying to sink Nehemiah and the building of the wall, but it won't do any good unless it gets inside It did get inside some, as we'll see in just a moment. Well, when this renewed criticism and renewed opposition started up, Nehemiah responds in a characteristic way. There are some things you do just as a pattern. That's always your response when you're involved in this situation. And a proper response always to negativity that does not arise from God or from people who are walking with God. Our proper response is to go to prayer and to go to work. So Nehemiah simply repeats the pattern in verses 8 and 9. He comes back. And uh, finally, verse 9 says, We pray to our God and post a guard night and day to meet this threat. Now, as we go on, we see that you cannot continually hear negativism without some of it rubbing off on you. And there are some people that are living in the outlying areas outside Jerusalem that are coming in on a regular basis to work on the walls and then they go home at night. When they go home at night, their neighbors are are saying, They're going to get you. They're going to slip in and put the knife in your cloak before you have a chance to turn around and see their face. And they were saying this repeatedly over and over and over again. I know of a married couple I've known for some time. And they they aren't part of this church, so I can safely talk about them. And they'll never know that I said anything, and you'll never know who they were, so I'm safe. But uh, in in this marriage, one of the persons is a kind of a critic. It's always wrong with something. And one, through the years, has kind of been a hopeful sort of a person. But I've noticed lately, uh, in the occasions I've had uh, to meet them, that the one that was hopeful is now beginning to get critical. That's just like all the criticism over the years has begun to now wear off. And it's kind of hard to maintain a positive uh, self-reference point when you're continually, all the time, just bombarded with everything's wrong. 
And that's the precise situation here that the friends of Nehemiah get in. They're just hearing this, this stuff all day long. You're going to get it. You guys aren't going to succeed. And notice that all this comes with the wall half up. They've already made tremendous progress. Sometime in this series, I'm going to talk about the six times in Nehemiah's experience where there, is, there, are, there are pressure points, there are opposition, because I think it's, it's a classic description with how the, uh, Satan would try to defeat us as persons or as a whole church in doing the work of God. One is at the conception stage of the work. Uh, there's all, you know, in, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, when Nehemiah is getting ready to leave Susa and go 900 miles away to Jerusalem, already he hears Sanballat. It, it, it displeases him what you're going to do. And then when you announce the task, we're going to do something. You haven't done a thing yet, you just announced it. There's Sanballat again. Then when you put your shovel into the ground and actually begin doing something, there's Sanballat again. And when the wall's half up, there he is again. And when the wall's completed, he's trying to trick you outside to assassinate you. So, so there never comes a point at which you're exempt from the pressure. But now the wall's half up. You'd think the people would have some courage. After all, we're halfway through. But it's like the old story of the optimist and the pessimist with a half glass of water. The pessimist says we're half... half what does the pessimist say? <laughs> it's half empty. And the optimist says it's half full. Well, some, some of the friends out in the outlying areas become discouraged. Verses 10 through 12 tells us about them. One of the reasons why they feel they're discouraged is they're exhausted. Now, I want to point out that their exhaustion, I think, is more mental than it is physically. There's no worse exhaustion than mental exhaustion. If I think I'm tired, it's surprising how tired my body gets. Now, I don't want to, you know, psychologically explain away everything. There is such a thing as being physically tired. But I find that when I'm mentally tired and spiritually tired, it, it sure makes my body ten times more tired. So, exhaustion. This, the men of Judah are coming saying the strength of the laborers is giving out. Now, notice this word is coming from the men of Judah. Men of Judah. Here was the tribe in Israel, according to Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 and 10, when, they were blessed, when Judah was blessed by his father Jacob. This prophecy was given to Judah and all who would be of Judah's band. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. In other words, Judah, you're always going to be the one who is at the forefront of the battle. Judah, you're the tribe that when you've got into conflict with the enemy, you're going to have your hand right on his neck. And maybe you're going to have his foot there too. And you're going to be the tribe that always has a governor and a ruler. Now, so here's the tribe which should be setting the pace for resisting the enemy. Instead, the seriousness of the depression is seen by the fact that it's coming from the men of Judah, the very people who ought to be in the forefront. They are exhausted and they have lost their vision. Verse 10, they say, there is much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. What they were doing is instead of focusing on the wall that was already half built, they took their eyes off the half built wall and began to look at all the rubble. And I want to submit that's a classic example of how we can really get discouraged in living the Christian life. We're walking along, the Lord has really blessed us, we've been growing strong, and then, and then there comes a moment in which the enemy wants to get us focusing on all the rubble, all the things that we haven't dealt with yet, all the problems that haven't been solved, all the nitty kinks in our personality that are still there in spite of God's grace and salvation. The wall's halfway up, but there's still rubble there. So what's the enemy want to do? He does not want you to look at that half-completed wall. He does not want you to know that here too God has helped you. He wants you to focus on all the rubble. And if any of us are honest long enough, it ain't very long until we can find the presence of rubble in our experience. Things that look like they are so totally bombed out and useless and burned that, that nothing could ever happen out of that that's constructive. So, lose your vision by concentrating on all the rubble. And of course, the men of Judah are explaining their failure, and, and often explaining failure is simply a ras rationalization designed to make failure look respectable. How often we rationalize away failure. Well, the task was just too great for me, kind of thing. Verse 11 tells us they were losing their, verses 11 and 12 tell us they were losing their confidence, too. The enemies were saying, we're going to slip in and kill you. So the, verse 12 says, then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. 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 You know, this just going on all night and day. Everybody's repeating it. Everybody's picking up the same song. Discouragement has brought lots of confidence. And losing confidence is a terrible thing. I gave you at the start an illustration of a successful wrestling match. 
If I think back painfully to the time I was a 10-year-old boy, and my mother, who was a pacifist, wouldn't, did not want me to fight and told me to turn the other cheek, and there was this kid that picked on me all the time, and the absolute dread that I lived of this little kid was going to beat me up, and he was little than I, but I wouldn't hit him back because I was afraid because my mother told me it was wrong to hit him back. She'd love your enemies and forgive him 490 times, 70 times 7. I lived in mortal fear. I know what that is. My mother finally prayed that kid out of town. So I, <laughs> that, was, that was her method of dealing with it. That's a terrible thing to lose confidence, to say, I'm not able to do that. I cannot do that. You don't really know me. And what they're doing, too, in verse 12, is they're dwelling upon the worst possible scenario. Ten times over. Ten times over. We're going to get it. We better get off the wall. And they have dwelt upon the worst that can happen. That's exactly where the enemy wants us. Dwell upon the worst thing that can happen. It's what he wants for me as a pastor of this church to concentrate on. He's saying to me all the time, I want you to think of the worst possible thing that can happen to this church. And then concentrate on that. It'll lose spiritual vigor. It won't have spiritual authority and power. It won't minister to people. Therefore, people will start going away. Your ministry will dry up on the vine. You have the gift of teaching, but... But, but that gift's going to be taken from you. And you know how when it's taken from you, people will quit showing up. That's how you know. Yeah. All these kinds of things. Someday people are going to quit giving and tithing. The economy is going to keep going up and they can't, they're not going to be able to afford to give anymore. You're going to have to cut back. You're going to have to write missionaries letters and tell them you can't keep supporting them. You're going to have to lay off staff. You're going to have to close things down. And you guys are crazy to go into a building program. Everybody knows that you shouldn't go into that these days. Churches shouldn't try that on. You know, all these, the worst possible scenario. I even struggled with this sermon this week. I had a terrible time getting this sermon put together this week. My, my wife knows this. The office knows this because I have to get the sermon outlined in by noon on Friday or it's, you don't get it. So it has, you know, normally I try to get the outline in by Thursday night. And here I am just struggling away Friday morning still, you know, until, until I struggle this thing through. And, and at one point I thought, maybe, just maybe, I'll have to get up to the congregation on Sunday morning and tell them, friend, somehow this text hasn't spoken to me this week. I don't know where it's going. I don't know what it said. And I'll just... Say amen, praise the Lord, and goodbye. <laughs> First time in eight years that I will have failed to have a sermon. And I thought, and, and then that kind of, I started chuckling. I thought, it, that's exactly in this passage, the worst possible scenario. Instead of looking at the fact that in eight years of pastoring this church, I have never one time come to the pulpit with God's help unprepared, never come at a time when I felt I didn't have a message. And in spite of that, uh, now we're going to get into a new pattern. No, and this is going to be the number one, first time, worst possible scenario. And when I realized that, by the way, it broke the whole sermon open. I began to realize what was going on in the false conflict. I wouldn't focus on the worst possible scenario. I'd focus on maybe what the Lord wanted to do through this passage. Well, so we, we realize some of the things that bring discouragement in our spiritual walk and in the life of a whole group of people. Nehemiah then mobilizes for success, verses 13 through 23. Discouragement can paralyze us if we let it. Nehemiah is not going to let it paralyze him. He says, therefore, that's the important word, therefore, in light of all this garbage that's going on, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. What's he do? In essence, what I think he's doing is he's letting the devil know that he's in for it for messing with him. Okay, you're going to say that... you. you your assassins are going to come in and slip in, then you better know that if they slip in, they're going to find every person armed. We're going to arm this whole camp, and you guys lay one glove on us, and you are going to be very, very sorry. And there is this standpoint from faith in which we rise up and say, when we are getting attacked, you are going to be sorry for this, devil, because this is going to come smashing down on your head. I read yesterday this uh, story. I don't know why I've not read it before. That, uh, it's just such an incredible story. The story of Johnny. The, uh, the 17 year old girl who in a diving accident uh, hit her, hit, struck her head on the bottom of the sand and permanently paralyzed herself so that today she is a quadriplegic. And this uh, recites the, the eight year struggle of hers to come out of this. To come out of this with some mental and spiritual wholeness. It's an incredible story. I strongly recommend this book. But you know what I, th I thought as I laid down this book, I thought of this text, I said, you know what? Satan tried to touch a 17-year-old girl and just really foul her up. And the Lord said, just like he did with Job, I'm going to bring this down on your ears. You're going to be sorry you ever messed with this girl. Because what this is going to do is advance my kingdom. And that's precisely what's happened. 
with Johnny's testimony. The story of how a person who has everything in the physical realm stripped away from her, yet finds God and finds that her life is more fulfilling, paralyzed than it was when she had the use of all of her faculties and was an athletic person and a vivacious person. She's still a very much vivacious person, just doesn't have control of her feet and hands. It came crashing down on his ears. There is a scripture continually which Johnny repeats, which is the hallmark of Christian experience. We know that God is working good in all things. We know that because Jesus is risen from the dead and that he's going to bring resurrection out of everything. We'd like, maybe in looking at it theologically, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus could be raised from the dead without ever having to go through death? It would be nice if he could demonstrate his resurrection power and he wouldn't actually have to cost him anything. He wouldn't have to go through death. But it don't work that way. You must die if you're going to be raised. And if God's going to display his power, he's going to do it in earthen pots, earthen vessels, that the excellency and the glory might belong to him. So one way to counter all this stuff is to simply say, well, boy, let the devil bring what he can and let all the acid be poured upon me that's possible. I'm going to, with God's help, turn this around. That's exactly what Nehemiah does. He looks to the Lord again, verse 14, his continual response, where he is praying in the midst of difficulty, and, uh, and, and reminding everyone of the Lord's greatness, he says, remember the Lord who's great and awesome. Remember who's on your side. Don't look at these puny guys over there. Remember God and keep working. He put them to work in a new way. Now they're going to have to work with a sword in one hand and a shovel in the other. And he said, nobody's going to get picked off through isolation in this camp. In fact, he did a very shrewd move. He put people together by families. And I tell you, when you're working with your family, there you've got some protection. And it may be a spiritual family, it may be a nuclear family, or that is a, a biological relationship. But Nehemiah, what he was, what he was saying too, is that the guy that had the trumpet was by my side. If anybody gets in trouble, we sound the trumpet and everybody gathers. What a marvelous advice. That when you get into trouble and you're going through spiritual conflict, don't try to take it alone. Don't get isolated. You'll get picked off. Get on the trumpet. And we have a different kind of trumpet, okay? We can pick up our trumpet and get on the phone to a brother or a sister and say, help me, I'm under attack. And be together in the family of God and get the kind of physical and relational support that we need to face the encounters that God has called us to face. Out of that, Nehemiah reaches a whole new level of commitment. Verses 21 through 23 says he's, now they're working longer hours than ever before. Remember, they complained about being exhausted. I think it was all in their mind because now they're working from dawn up to sunset. They change their routine. Uh, some of them, uh, in fact, they make the people move inside the town. They've been living outside. Again, a shrewd move. Nehemiah realizing that these people when they go home every night are listening to all the negative critics. So he says, hey, let's get them inside the wall. They can defend in that way too. They don't have to go home to all the critics. He re isolates them from the, from the negative people. And he even denies himself legitimate comforts. Now, as the outline is laid out before you in the bullet, and I'm not sure that it always works in the fine details in the, this exact order, but the basic principles are always there that defeat internal and external is always staring us in the face and we must learn to fight spiritually. Our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are spiritual to the pulling down of mighty strongholds. Paul says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And he says to us, therefore stand and take the armor of God. Betty Greaves shared with me a letter this week, which in a stark way shows us a story of a couple that is facing far more dire circumstances in terms of their rebuilding a wall than maybe any of us in here face. And I simply share this letter first of as an encouragement to you and your struggle that there are people who are real, who, who in the kingdom of God are going through inordinate amounts of pressure and yet are standing firm. And the fact that they can stand firm is a great inspiration to us to stand firm. And also I read the letter as an opportunity to have you have a prayer uh, time for uh, Doug and Ruth Clark uh, in the coming days. Doug and Ruth Clark are missionaries in Izmir, Turkey, right near the ancient center of Ephesus. I had the chance several years ago to be with Doug and Ruth for several days in Izmir. It's an incredibly difficult situation. They're in the country as language teachers, although their full-time interest is being missionaries and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're uh, on the country in a basis. They could get kicked out in 48 hours. It's very dangerous now in Turkey. There's a great deal of anti-American feeling. Uh, and they describe Ruth writing home to her mother, Betty Greed, shared this letter this past week. She says, Today we had bad news. You must have seen it in the papers already. Dave Goodman, a young friend of ours in Adana, city some distance from Izmir, was shot at his door on Saturday morning. 
He'd been there about a year and a half. Very, very nice, brilliant in music. Had just been promoted to the director of courses at the language tutoring school where he worked. His wife, Jenny, is eight months pregnant. They were here with Oper Operation Mobilization. That's a missions group. He just opened the door Saturday morning, saw a stranger, and was shot four times. Jenny was in another room, and the man had gone by, had gone by the time she could run in. Dave died on the way to the hospital. There are no clues yet as to who did it. So they bought a little plot. Friends cleaned the body and put it in a sheet in a coffin. And yesterday at their normal worship time, 1 o'clock, they buried him with a Turkish sermon and an English one, singing Turkish songs that Dave had written. We saw a little article in the paper with the name spelled Corman, as we weren't sure. At about 1, we finally learned the story, and Doug has since, Doug is Ruth's husband, has since been on the telephone in contact with friends in Ankara and Adana. Ironically, at about the same time, the acknowledged leader of the Workers and the head of overseas ministries for Turkey, Dennis Alexander, got his notice, 48 hours to leave. Again, we don't know why yet. We may never know. They don't have to give a reason. We really can't say that there's a, a, a connection. We can't say what the end result of the two instances will be. If it's a fairly perfunctory investigation, in Dave's case, it may not touch anyone else. He had radio broadcast recording equipment in his closets and a year's worth of scripts. They weren't touched by the police. Mostly we feel grief more than fear or anger. I hope you don't have to battle with fear for us. We are safe. God's plan will go forward and life goes on. Well, that last paragraph says it all. We feel grief more than fear or anger. I hope you don't have to battle with fear for us. We are safe. In spite of the fact that one of their compatriots in the gospel is shot, we are safe. The confidence arises in God. They're looking at the wall that's half finished, not at all the rubble. God's plan will go forward. Great confidence in God. You say, that defies logic. You better believe it defies logic. Anything that's done in the kingdom of God, I think, has at its core a, def a defying of logic and an arising of faith to believe that somehow what God does, he will complete. What he begins, he will sustain. That the mystery of faith must deal with the fact that there is often a bombing away of what we think to have been the perfect will of God. And out of that, God builds something in its place which is even more incredible and super strong. Life goes on. Now I, lay, I look at a letter like that and I overlay it against the struggles that I work with and the pressures and it makes me realize that as we walk with God, there, there are differing levels of persecution, opposition, and stress that we face. But an underlying principle rises through them all. If the enemy can, he will pick us off the work. He would do it through discouragement. He would do it through fear. He would do it through intimidation. He would do it through pressure. He will continue to remind us that it can't be done. No one's ever done it before. And you can't do it now. But if we will put our faith in God, we'll be toughened as a result. God's work will prosper as a result. And our life will be made strong as a result. I want to tell you that God will never allow a wall to be built without opposition. I want to tell you as well that strength is gained by overcoming adversity, not by ignoring it, not by giving into it, not by pretending that adversity doesn't exist. Strength is gained when we overcome. As John says, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Let's pray. We lift our hearts now, Lord, for these friends in Turkey, for Doug and Ruth, for this young girl, Jenny, who's been widowed. We just pray for Jenny now, Lord, that in your own marvelous way you will sustain her and that out of this, as Paul says, the gospel will actually be advanced. We confess that there are times when we do not know and understand your ways, but we are wise enough to know that in your plan and in your work there is resurrection at every turn of the road. And when we see you face to face, we will look back on all the moments in life of our deepest pain and hurt, the moments when we privately in our heart wondered where you were, and we will see anew that you were there. You were there with us as you were with Jesus in those three days he was in the grave. You were waiting to do some greater deed. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in you, O oh Lord. Pray for Doug and Ruth that you will continue to give them great power as they live there for you. Thank you, Lord, for their attitude which looks upon the people you've called them to minister to with love and not with suspicion, with hope and not with fear. We look into our own lives as well, Lord. 
How many times has Jesus said to Peter, Satan has desired us that he might set us like wheat. That Satan might put us through the meat grinder of knowing that we've been a failure. The times when we should have stood loyal and true, like Peter, we have failed. He would like to remind us of that rubble in our life, those kinks in our own personal development which have not been straightened out. We praise you, Lord Jesus, that you are here today to fill us with hope, to renew us. And I pray right now, Jesus, in your mighty name, that every attack that you have made, that Satan has made against persons in this room will be defeated for the glory of Jesus Christ. And that in each of the individual warfares that we wage, there will be a surging forth of the mighty strength and power of the Holy Spirit. That for all those people that Satan has whispered to us, you can't witness to them, they wouldn't listen to you, or you don't know enough to witness, whatever made you think you could be a witness, for all of that lie, that your spirit would flood into us and fill us with boldness and faith, and we'll make Satan, the enemy, regret everything he's put in our head that has reminded us of our weakness. Because in you we go from glory unto glory. And all the efforts of the enemy to paralyze this work and every work with a subtle internal doubt that goes on within our hearts as to whether we are able for a task that you've called us to do. We thank you in your name that you will cause walls in our spiritual life, walls in our development as a people to go up and the glory and the honor will be yours because all we do is look to you in prayer and it's your confidence that fills us, that gives us the strength to put our hand to the work. And when we are tempted to quit, to drop out and to say we can never make it we know Lord Jesus that you are there and with your help we shall overcome we praise you for the word of testimony and for the victory which is our faith in you and your great power and in your name we tear down strongholds and we build for you let there be no person here Lord that thinks that they cannot live the Christian life let there be no person here who thinks that they're gone beyond your grace. Let there be no person here who looks at their life and maybe the mess that they're in and thinks that they have to accept that for the rest of their life, day in and day out, hour in and hour out. But in your name, Lord Jesus, we believe you can defy those who say you'll never change, those who say you'll never defeat the past, those who say the sin in your life is too strong, the hurt you've experienced from your family is too mighty. We, in the name of Jesus, rise against that and do not agree with it and say if the Son sets us free, we will be free indeed. And we confess that you have come to give us life and to give it more abundantly and we'll take our stand with you. And we praise you that your work will go onward and forward through us that the glory might be yours. We, these weak vessels, will bear your mighty glory. In Jesus' name.